So you don't have to have an NDE to know everything I know about uh, that infinitely loving God for us. Okay, we are here with Dr. Evan Alexander, the author of Proof of Heaven. This is a really a revolutionary book. He's a North Carolina neurosurgeon whose life drastically changed 15 years ago. So welcome, Dr. Alexander. Well, AJ, it's great to be here with you today. Thanks for having me on. Tell us briefly what happened 15 years ago. I would say it was probably the most transformative event of my life. And in many ways, my view of the world, which previously had been through the conventional scientific lens of materialism, changed dramatically to realizing that consciousness is fundamental in the universe. I mean, it was a complete flip. And I've spent the 15 years since that time reconciling my experience with modern science. Uh, and very briefly, for those who haven't heard my story or read Proof of Heaven or seen any of the interviews with me, uh, I'll point out that I was amnesic. That's an atypical feature of near-death experiences, that I had no memories of Evan Alexander's life. I had no earthly language, no knowledge of humans, Earth, this universe. It really was an empty slate. And of course, when I first came back to this world, even though my brain was wrecked, it recovered rapidly. And I just thought, well, my doctors told me that my meningitis was so severe that you know all lobes of my brain were affected and no part of my brain was left there to harbor any kind of dream or hallucination. But I thought it was way too real to be real. And I, I, I thought that it made some sense early on that my memories would be deleted because of the meningitis, because of the extensive involvement of my neocortex. But the reality is all the memories came back over about two months, even more complete than they had been before. So the amnesia is just there as a feature. And I, I would say that uh, all near-death experiences are tailored for the individual soul. And for a neurosurgeon interested in consciousness, mine involved meningitis and uh, kind of a wipeout of what parts of my brain neuroscience would say were necessary for my experience. And that's why it means my experience means so much to the scientific community. But very briefly, to kind of answer your question, what happened during that week-long coma due to severe gram-negative bacterial meningoencephalitis? It all started in the earthworm's eye view, a primitive course unresponsive realm. But I was rescued from that by this slowly spinning white light that came packaged with a perfect musical melody. And that light served as a portal, a wormhole, up into higher and higher, higher and higher levels. This portal led up into this brilliant ultra-real gateway valley, which was kind of an intersection of earth and, and spiritual realms. In many ways, it was like Plato's world of ideals. It was a world of perfection. This beautiful valley, sparkling waterfalls and crystal blue pools, and all these souls dancing, joy and merriment, incredible festivities in this verdant valley, very fertile, no sign of any death or decay. And I was witnessing all that as a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing. Now, those who've read the story realize how important my spiritual companion was. She was there on the butterfly wing, a beautiful young woman, sparkling blue eyes, high cheekbones, high forehead, broad smile, soft brown hair framing her lovely face. And her message to me, I think, was a central message that I was to bring back to this world from my NDE. You are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. You were deeply cared for. And that message was delivered to me from her telepathically. She never had to say a word. Her kind of emotional truth melded with my mind. And I knew the deep truth of this. And it was very comforting and reassuring. Uh, now, it turns out that uh, a lot of what I witnessed in that realm was just kind of a springboard to higher and higher levels. And I remember this uh, seeing all of this collapsing down, this four-dimensional space-time and the material world collapsing down, all of that spiritual realm. And, and do note that time flow in that realm is very, very different from Earth time. That's why people have often described life reviews. This goes back thousands of years in the history of NDEs. Life reviews, your life flashing before your eyes, basically is a reliving of the events, not just a remembering. And note that it encompasses birth to death, everything in between, and even beyond that. Uh, so that realm is one of kind of eternity, far beyond our earth time. And people can get very confused thinking that the clock is ticking in that spiritual realm the same way the clock is ticking on earth. That's not true at all. 
And that's a much higher view of time and of, of causal relationships and all. So it turns out, though, that even that world was collapsing down. And what I had witnessed, uh, the beautiful melody that had ushered me up from the earth my view into this gateway valley, now these angelic choirs up above were emanating chants, anthems, hymns that would just thunder through my awareness. They provided yet another musical portal or wormhole to higher and higher levels. And I remember seeing all that spiritual realm in deep time or meta time collapsing down until what I was left with was this complex oversphere. And then I was in what I call the core, where all dualities completely resolved. I came to realize that our very conscious awareness is sourced in that infinitely loving God force at the core of the universe. And told in the core realm, we will teach you many things, but you'll be going back. And the E's are different, yet they have common traits. Based on this, can you more or less tell me what you think, why and the East are so different, yet they share common elements. Experience is primarily tailored for the experiencer. That's it. That's the only reason NDEs exist, is to help the experiencer come to a deeper knowledge of their identity and their relationship with the universe and this sense of interconnectedness. Now, to me, when I hear NDEs, I very commonly kind of here associating factors that group them together. And this these have to do with these themes of encountering souls of departed loved ones, of going through life reviews, of feeling this incredible sense of being at home, of a spiritual home. So it's very comforting to be there, the very presence of it, the comfort, comforting nature of it. These are the kind of ingredients that are, are stable throughout many of these experiences. Now, just because the settings are different. So the setting for me, you know, this beautiful valley with butterflies and things like that, that doesn't mean that we're in different realms or different territories. I mean, the, the corollary example I would give you is what if we took 10 people randomly selected and we teleported all of them to the general area of Paris, France, and gave them 12 hours to interact and then come back to this world? Well, they all have extremely different stories to tell, even though there's only one Paris, France, because of where they landed, who they encountered, what the adventure was, what their life setting was up to their, that point. I mean, all these things lead to, and so it's actually surprising you don't have a much wider variation in NDEs. I see the commonalities as the strong thread that really unites them. And I think you would agree, uh, Bruce Grayson, Many other investigators of NDEs who have studied them scientifically have come to find common ingredients. And yet, to me, it's absolutely no surprise whatsoever that the stories and their details can sound a little bit different. But it's just because all of us are different. And the heavenly spiritual realm has a tremendous amount more territory than Paris, France. So I would expect, you know, a tremendous amount of kind of variation. And yet we see these common themes, no matter what the medical conditions that may be leading to the experience. And this is our big, big indicator that the brain is not creating them at all, but it's the process of the brain getting out of the way that allows for these experiences to manifest so strongly. So for me as a neuroscientist, knowing all that I know about these experiences from having met and talked with literally thousands of people who have had them, it makes perfect sense that the stories are as they are, and they're really representing a common realm that is surprisingly similar in spite of people's cultures, their beliefs, their religious beliefs, et cetera. I mean, the content of these journeys is amazingly similar. And, and for example, there's a beautiful book that looks at the five major religious faiths of this world and compares them to NDEs, NDEs being the gold standard. That book is by Robert Copps, C-O-P-P-E-S. It's called The Essence of Religions. And he really takes it a long way and, and points to the NDE is, is really the gold standard and that religions, you know, have had thousands of years to teach us the golden rule, which is the ultimate lesson of the life review in NDEs to various degrees of success. But the NDE community brings it in very strongly that we must treat each other as we would like to be treated. The golden rule is written into the fabric of the universe through these life reviews that occur, and th they really show us that we're sharing the dream of the one mind. Because as Bruce Grayson reported in the fall of 2021 in an article in the Journal of Near-Death Studies, life reviews are especially remarkable because they 
are more real than real. They involve a reliving and not just a remembering them. And also very importantly, that they're often described as kind of the common view of events from everybody's perspective, but they show that we're sharing the dream of the one mind. So for example, if you've been busy handing out pain and suffering to others your whole life, in your life review, you have to be on the receiving end of that. There's something that has to do with that life review. And so if you've handed all that pain and suffering, you might have a pretty hellish life review because you have to be on the receiving end of all that kind of hardship that you've been part of handing out to the world. And from my perspective, the life review is a beautiful kind of course correction that helps us make amends for any of the transgressions against, you know, the primordial mind by injuring and offending others that we've done in our life. So it's it's a beautiful example of how NDEs can gently nudge us back towards a life of acknowledging the oneness of mind, our shared experience, and that if we hurt another, we're really hurting ourselves. And that's where I think near-death experiences and life reviews have a tremendous amount to teach us. We're all in this together, and that binding force of love informs this world we need to change for the better. We need to start treating each other and our fellow living beings with a greater respect for the divine and sacred creatures that we are. That's where I think the science of consciousness can greatly improve and bring harmony and, and peace to our planet much more readily than religions have been able to do over the ages, because they really do point to the essence of this notion of the oneness of mind and how we're all in this together. Very important to point out that the content of near-death experiences seems to be suited to the participant and can vary tremendously. The interpretation may depend on your prior religious beliefs. So the language you use might reflect your prior religious beliefs, but the content does not. It's not limited in that fashion. And for example, I grew up in a very conventional Methodist upbringing in North Carolina, and yet I had a very profound experience of being one with that God force, which is something I was certainly never taught to be possible in my church upbringing. And also that strong sense of, of connection through that binding force of love was just so extraordinary and went well beyond what I might have might have expected. But I think that's the important thing is that our religious beliefs can change how we talk about it uh, and interpret it, but it doesn't change the original content. And the other thing to point out is I realized after my journey that infinitely loving God force, that force of kindness, mercy, compassion, and acceptance is, is there in its beautiful, uh, natural, organic form as our spiritual home. And whether you want to call it God, Allah, Brahman, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh, Great Spirit, I don't care what the words are. They're irrelevant, and they, and they pretend that you can kind of own this and define it. But that force is universal, and it includes all of us. It is absolutely all-inclusive of all living forms throughout the cosmos. And that's why any religion that tries to become exclusive and restrictive is falsely leading itself away from the original message of unification and oneness and love that is the true message of the prophet. So I, I would say that we really need to just honor more the, the rule as presented by NDEs of this love and compassion that are unlimited uh, for each other, all inclusive, and, and stop uh, paying attention when a religion serves anti-spiritual purposes by being non non-inclusive, and even fomenting, you know, hatred and conflict and violence against others. That's where religion has really completely lost its way and needs to be discarded. So do you have any religious beliefs? I believe that they're uh, just like 90% plus of near-death experiencers throughout all history, that there is an absolute concrete, real, divine, loving God force at the core of the universe, at the core of all that happens, that is the very source of our conscious awareness. And I do not believe that any one prophet owns that God force, that in fact, we have to admit that that God force is universal, uh, and that when people take a message of prophets and, and try and capitalize on it and control it, they're trying to control human beings. And that's what religions uh, sometimes have tried to do. Now, religions... Uh, in many, many cases, have been beautiful sources of spiritual oneness and uh, kind of wholeness. That's great when that happens, but it's not always the case when religious ideologues and, uh, you know, 
the syncophants and, and what have you start to use a religion to control other people. And that's what I think is such a shame. And the kind of beauty and organic uh, uh, kind of purity of the NDE is something that any sentient being can take through meditation centering prayer to discover these deep and profound truths. You don't have to have an NDE. You know, everything I know about uh, that infinitely loving God force in the spiritual realm, if you just spend time every day in meditation or centering prayer, you start to discover that uh, beautiful realm on your own, as long as you are able to get rid of that little voice in your head. So many people think of the voice in our head as their consciousness. That couldn't be further from the truth. The voice in your head is a, a mainly an ego voice, uh, and there's an aspect of you, higher soul, that is far wiser than that, that you can come in touch with through meditation, centering prayer. This is why I use sacred acoustics daily. It's a form of binaural beat brainwave entrainment. Uh, it was uh, developed by my partner and co-author of the book, Living in the Mindful Universe, Karen Newell. But for those who want to learn more about this powerful technique of separating conscious awareness from the here, now, and sense of self, just go to sacredacoustics.com. But I use that uh, technique daily. I have for more than 11 years now to return to my near-death experience, not just to recover memories, but to uh, cultivate relationships with those beautiful, loving forces. <clears throat> that I first encountered in my NDE. But if you go to sacredacoustics.com, you will see that there's a, a, a number of different uh, possibilities. Plus, she has an excellent page on sacredacoustics.com. You've mentioned that only a small percentage of NDEs are hellish or, or negative. And that most, I think you mentioned like it was a 5% or something like that. About that. And and um, uh, this means that most are like heavenly experience with either contacts with God or with paradise or with Jesus or a spiritual being. And, and can you tell us a, a bit about your studies? What have you researched and what, ha what are your conclusions now that we're reaching the end of the interview? Well, I think the most important thing I would say from observing the near-death experience literature over time, over thousands of years across all cultures, and I can highly recommend the writings of Gregory Shushan. He's, he's written about uh, NDEs and indigenous cultures and come to some fascinating conclusions to give us kind of a bigger picture of the nature of the realm uh, that we're talking about, this uh, spiritual realm. But the interesting thing is that 90% of people, and that includes many who might have gone into the experience as an atheist or agnostic, 90% of them come away uh, with a very strong belief in the reality of God in some form. Uh, and, and mainly when you look at, uh, for example, the book of Christopher Copps and the, the deep lessons of all NDEs taken together, uh, those lessons are really of love, compassion, kindness, mercy, and acceptance, uh, forgiveness, gratitude. These are the main ingredients. So I think once you realize that people who've had these profound experiences uh, come away in large measure supporting the reality of an infinitely loving uh, kind of God force at the core of the universe, maybe we should all consider that that is part of reality, that this is part of their experience. And especially as we come to realize that materialist science, which people used to think was a refutation of these kind of spiritual experiences, but in the quantum informed era of scientific exploration and examination of the mind brain question and the uh, mechanism of, 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 of mind and brain and how they interact, the more we come to realize that unity of mind and that that binding force of love so obvious in the NDE must be a necessary ingredient uh, of this thing we call humanity and the human spirit because it is experienced so, so commonly and not just in NDEs. But for example, if you look at the work of Christopher Kerr, he's a hospice uh, worker in Buffalo, New York. He wrote a book called uh, Death is But a Dream. Uh, I highly recommend that book. It makes it uh, very clear that the dying process pretty much mirrors exactly what we see in near-death and shared death experiences, especially with reunion with departed loved ones. As Gregory Shushen says, that's the most common feature of NDEs across all cultures, is connectedness with loved ones. And then when you study the data and start to realize it's not just wishful thinking, but often that we're getting very powerful uh, and concrete messages that can only happen 
if the loved one's soul is still able to give us new information, that's when you start to realize the power of understanding this eternity of soul and of our soul relations with the loved ones that does not die with the death of the physical body. Well, thanks a lot, Dr. Alexander. This was really a pleasure. I'm glad uh, we had this interview. Thanks for coming, and I hope we can talk again in the future. Well, AJ, that would be great. I'd love to chat with you again, and thanks so much. I hope you have a great day.